better work together and address the grand societal challenges of our time. And we see that uh, crisis disasters are becoming uh, more and more connected, uh, multifaceted, and in a globalized world, um, what happens in one place may have an influence of what happens somewhere else. Uh, and we also see that probably the COVID-19 pandemic has made clear to everyone, probably we already knew that we as uh, attending in this forum, but the general public is now aware that, for instance, virologists alone uh, cannot uh, fix the COVID-19 pandemic. In the same way in which, uh, for instance, I'm a professor in hydrology, and hydrologists alone cannot fix all problems that we have with flooding. Uh, so we, we need to collaborate. That's, that's essentially what CNBS stands for. Uh, we aim to support interdisciplinary research on disaster risk reduction. And to do that, uh, CNBS brings together earth social and engineering scientists working in different departments and units at Uppsala University, Karlstad University, and the Swedish Defense University. Our focus is on early career science. Uh, we have had more than, we have had 30 PhD students that completed their, uh, uh, their work and uh, 15 that they are ongoing. And um, on top of, of uh, PhD studies, we also support postdoctoral uh, researchers. And currently there are seven postdocs that are working in CNDS. We organize seminar series and we are active on social media, primarily on Twitter. You can see here at CNDS underscore Sweden, and on LinkedIn. When we uh, think about early career scientists, um, we have um, different uh, type of approaches that you can see in different places around the world. Uh, the traditional way in which PhD studies are done is what can be called I-shaped profile, which is traditional in, uh, in academia, in which uh, doing your PhD, uh, we, we, you try to focus on one aspect and you go very deep on that, on that topic. Uh, of course, this is very different from a generalist profile, which could be uh, the case of a science journalist, in, we, in which you have a broad knowledge of multiple, uh, multiple uh, topics and multiple fields. And maybe sometimes you go deep when you have to write an article, but you never go really deep. The ambition in CNDS is to uh, have uh, to build on a T-shaped profile. Uh, so with, where with the vertical axis means that um, PhDs and postdocs go deep on one specific topic, they become master on that. Uh, and, but at the same time, they also develop uh, skills in working across disciplines. And of course, this could be done at different level, multidisciplinary works, in which we engage with peers that uh, work in other disciplines while staying in our own discipline, or interdisciplinary work in which we produce new knowledge, which goes beyond the disciplinary boundaries. And lastly, transdisciplinary research in which this new knowledge is uh, co-generated with stakeholders and other actors in the field of disasters, which is the final ambition of CMDS. Our research focuses on the interplay of natural hazards and social vulnerability. Uh, as we, the title of the forum suggests, we look into, uh, into the global to local um, interactions. So we, we, local crises in a given place are often the interactions of not natural hazards and vulnerability. Uh, natural processes have a negative impacts or uh, certain type of consequences on the social on the social, um, uh, social system, uh, which also perceive different type of risk in a different way and responds through policies and measures that in turn will alter the characteristic of natural hazards. This type of interplay, which, it, which happens very often at the local level, is also influenced by uh, global changes that occur at different scales. Environmental changes, such as climate, climate change, for instance, global warming that has an influence on the frequency, magnitude, the spatial distribution of, of many types of natural hazards, 
or socioeconomic trends, globalization, economic crisis can have an influence on the vulnerability and the governance institutions and critical infrastructure in uh, local. And, and thus, again, we'll, we'll reshape this type of interplay. So that's, that's our focus in CNDS. And, uh, and of course, besides research, we, we try to work with society and work with the new generation of uh, experts in disaster risk reduction. One of the activities consists of the CNDS Summer School, uh, which is truly interdisciplinary, both in terms of lecturers and participants. And um, uh, this event, which is also sponsored by the European Geoscience Union, uh, normally attracts about 200 international applicants from everywhere in the world. And um, we, we, we had um, two uh, events here at Uppsala, 2018-2019. Uh, and uh, over the past two years, uh, we did this event online because of the pandemic. At the same time, we, we, we also could reach a broader audience and uh, um, going uh, more uh, beyond the European context with online events. There are also a number of international events. Um, some of you uh, may recall the NEEDS conference in Uppsala in June 2019, which is the Northern European Conference on Emergency and Disaster Studies. Some of us in CNDS are active also with the UN uh, Initiative for Disaster Risk Reduction and participate to different forum around the world, such as the European Forum in Rome, November 2018. And um, uh, most recently, uh, CNDS also co-organized the Youth, youth Plenary Session uh, in Delft in the Netherlands for the first Sociodrology Conference, uh, which was attended by uh, 300 um, uh, scientists interested in human-nature interactions in uh, different places around the world. And then we have CNDS Forum, as today, uh, which is our uh, key uh, event. Uh, this takes place normally every two years. The last time was in Karstad in November 2018. Uh, and then we postpone uh, the event, which is occurring today because of the uh, pandemic. For many months, we have been postponing with the hope to have this event in a physical, uh, in-person um, uh, type of conference. Unfortunately, this was not possible. Hopefully, the next one. Um, we will have the chance to meet and interact uh, in uh, three dimensions. And uh, uh, besides the forum, we have an ongoing dialogue with um, practitioners, decision makers, and other actors, also through the reference group, which brings together um, um, uh, different um, fellows at MSB, MSB SMHI, uh, CIPRI, Lens for Secondary, and uh, uh, BTI. We also organize seminars, and if you are, would like to be informed about our seminars, you can be part of our main list, panel discussions, uh, uh, to, to keep a dialogue on this field and the different facets of it. When we work across disciplines, uh, sometimes uh, you uh, may be told that you are naive, and that probably uh, it doesn't really work. You can see in this cartoon, for instance, that there are a lot of caricatures about uh, different uh, disciplines. So here we see a psychologist saying that sociology is just applied psychology. Biologists saying psychology is just applied biology and so on and so forth up to the mathematicians saying that, um, yeah, essentially they are on top of it. And there is a lot of this going on, uh, which is in terms of jokes. And of course, we like jokes, but in these jokes, there, there are also some preconceptions and caricatures which do not help this type of co collaboration. And uh, you also see very often um, uh, uh, the, the, po the problem that uh, health, social and engineering science sciences are not compatible because they have different ontology, they are, differently, they are different from an epistemological point of view and methodological viewpoint. And uh, uh, however, uh, I mean, Clearly, there are challenges when working together, but uh, the experience in, uh, that we have had in uh, CNDS is that uh, within each domain and in uh, different disciplines, academics still hold different ontological and epistemological and methodological positions. In other words, uh, to make an example which is direct to me, not all hydrologists have exactly the same methods, 
and the, the, the same approach. And when you look into this spectrum, you can see that some are aligned with scholars from other disciplines. Uh, for instance, I can be aligned to some, I work well with some anthropologists like Susan, who is um, moderating uh, today. And these overlaps create the most productive spaces for collaboration. And when we do this overlap, this is where we are lacking knowledge. This type of, um, uh, the, the knowledge we, which goes beyond the disciplinary domains, which were useful to advance our knowledge to, 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 that we have today, but we need to go beyond that if we want to tackle uh, today's uh, complex and multifaceted issues. And many funders in, in Sweden, we see here VR, Formas mentioned since they found some of our projects, or in Europe, they, they support interdisciplinary research more and more. There is growing support. And this is, uh, and this shows that there is productive space. So there are challenges, but it is feasible. It is actually quite exciting. We normally bring together different type of methods. I'm not gonna get into the details, but in uh, interdisciplinary work, we often combine uh, qualitative and quantitative methods. Uh, we, uh, th there is an interaction because each research method has some limitations and other research methods have some advantages. But when we bring together them together, we can compensate for them and get, uh, and get uh, a more robust or uh, credible type of knowledge. So this, this is where we combine quantitative models with more qualitative case studies in which we can try to explore the co causal mechanism. So for instance, the model uh, uh, can help us quantify, but then with a the case study, we can explain why we get a certain type of trends, certain type of patterns. And then we can also see whether what happens in a place is also happening elsewhere. And nowadays, many, many fellows are engaged with global analysis in which we can look at uh, whether a specific uh, phenomenon is just happening in one place or it can be generalized. And if it can be generalized, what are the social and natural conditions in which uh, such type of archetype, which we call, tends to emerge? So I often uh, show this slide um, with a, a solar eclipse um, to, to the students. And um, the reason why I do this, uh, well, there are many reasons why I do this. The first one is in fact, that this, it, it has been my entire life that I had the dream uh, to experience a solar eclipse and I failed so far. So it's really uh, a quite difficult thing. At the same time, I don't want to fly and uh, increase emissions to go and, and see a, a solar eclipse. So I was trying to figure out when the next one will be somewhere in Europe, uh, somewhere between Sweden and Italy, which is where I spend most of my life. And this is happening on the 3rd of September, 2081. Uh, which is quite some time from now. Um, I will be more than 100 years old, not much more than 100, but still, maybe I can make it. It is also my birthday. But the key point here is the precision and accuracy with which this map is produced. See, this is uh, uh, 60 years from now, and we, we can see at what time exactly at the second, uh, the, um, the, the evolution of the solar eclipse. Now, if we ask the same question, like when will the next flooding hit Uppsala and what will be its impact? How will society respond to it? How will policy change in the aftermath? Will risk increase or will decrease? There will be learning processes after that. We don't have such answer. And the reason is that uh, it's about complexity. The solar system is huge, but it's dynamically simple. It is highly predictable. It's primarily driven by the gravity force. And uh, see, already in, in, the, in the 1970s, when they launched the Voyager, they could predict the, the trajectory in a way that it could go close to all, uh, all the planets uh, over time. It was a problem of finding the right technology to have that, but not a mathematical issues to make such a prediction. In our social natural systems, they are dynamically complex. There are feedback loops, tipping points, heterogeneity and interconnections with other systems across time and spatial scales. As a result, it is highly unpredictable. And we have this complexity also when it comes to disaster risk reduction. There are different trade-offs because we don't have a single risk. We are facing multiple risks. 
under the COVID-19 pandemic, this was clear to everyone, also to the general public. What do you do? Do you close down the school to reduce the rate of infection? Or, but at the same time, risk uh, the uh, social, physical, and mental well-being of kids, the family, or you keep the school open, and then you have issues in terms of infections and so on and so forth. So we often deal with trade-off. Uh, we have multiple risk, and also these risks are characterized by uncertainty. We cannot exactly pre uh, predict that. We can give uh, a qualitative understanding of them. We can predict some of the physical processes, but since risk is, is emerging from the interplay of human and natural systems, they, they, there will always be some uncertainty around uh, the characterization. So multiple hazards that are also perceived differently by different people. And there are also different goals. So we, 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 we have, we have risk, but we also have different type of opportunities. And, uh, and on top of this, there is not like a solution out there. The key question is always uh, for whom? Society is heterogeneous. So when we respond, the different measures that are put in place to respond to natural hazards will have cost and benefits that are unevenly distributed in a, in a society. And who is making that decision? At the same time, the impact of natural hazards is also not evenly distributed in a, in a society. So this heterogeneity makes the entire process more complex and also unavoidably political. So when we nowadays speak about following the science, what we offer at CNBS is to uh, trying to deal with this complexi complexity with interdisciplinary methods. We, we think that it is key to keep a big picture and uh, avoid shortcut solutions. Shortcut solutions may often uh, treat the symptoms, but not going to the root causes of, of the problem. And thus the, these fixes will perpetuate the same reasons that led us to the disaster. I mean, the, the issue of uh, social inequality that was very clearly under COVID-19, that marginalized group, low socioeconomic status groups, they were mostly affected by the COVID-19. Some of the responses have increased inequalities. So they've been made worse the root causes of, of this uh, disaster. So that, that, these are points that we can also discuss later in the panel, but uh, this is what CNDS is working on. Interdisciplinarity comes with a cost. Uh, John Taki said that um, it's far better an approximate answer to the right question, which is often vague, than the exact answer to the wrong question, which you can make it as precise as you want. So that's something that probably characterizes also our work. So uh, with this, I conclude. I just leave this slide as a summary. The key point here is that um, uh, I, I wish you to enjoy this second part of the of the forum, and um, and we will as CNDS keep on uh, supporting uh, uh, and providing incentives to have more cross disciplinary work in um, in the field of natural hazards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giuliano, uh, for that. Uh excellent introduction into to not only to CNDS but also into the field of research uh, indeed that engages us all here this afternoon approximately right rather than precisely wrong I find that very very good <laughs> so thank you for that and I want to um, take the opportunity to remind to welcome those of you who who have arrived uh, and uh, remind you that if your name is Stephanie Young in this in this uh, um, in this room, uh, you might want to change that to your uh, right name by by clicking on your on your little box uh, up at the uh, the upper end right end on the three dots, and you can rename yourself uh, because for technical reasons, uh, our uh, coordinator's name is Stephanie Young, and and for technical reasons. Uh, when you logged in, uh, you, you're, many of you are named that way. We we're, were all so. So thank you. Um, and uh, without further ado, I 
have the pleasure to introduce now um, our uh, keynote speaker all the way from the Netherlands with us today. Uh, it's Paul at Hart. Hi, Paul. Welcome to, uh, to CNBS. It's good to see you. And before I give you the word, I would like to introduce you uh, in more detail for those of you who don't know Paul. Um, Paul at Hart is a professor of public administration at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And you are still the Associate Dean of the Netherlands School of Public Administration in the Hague. That's right. It's, uh, it's the Netherlands School of Public Administration and the Utrecht School of Governance. Yeah, it's, okay. it's okay. complicated. It's yeah. complicated, but that, that's where you are, where they, where, where they can find you. Um, Paul has a long uh, track record and many years of research, training and, and consultancy and, uh, and advisory work uh, with governments in the Netherlands, in Sweden as well, in Australia. And his work covers political and public sector leadership, policy education, public accountability and crisis management. Uh, Paul has published extensively on these topics and the list is far too long to, to give a count of here. But I can mention uh, what I believe should be uh, among your last books anyway, uh, a co-authored book with Arian Boyne and Alan McConnell, uh, published this year by Springer Link, uh, called Governing the Pandemic, the Politics of Navigating a Mega Crisis, uh, which uh, uh, seems to be uh, uh, to the point here today, uh, for sure. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to draw on that, on that work in your presentation. So. The challenge of maintaining focus on DRR, disaster risk reduction issues, while dealing with a long-term and looming COVID crisis. So over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, uh, Suzanne, and uh, thanks for the invitation to, uh, to present here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you uh, again. It's been a while since we actually interacted, but uh, we go back a long way and uh, I certainly go back a long way with some people that I, I notice are in the audience today. So I feel partly among friends, but partly um, uh, also among people that um, I don't know, that I'm also not aware um, of their disciplinary background. So um, if if this this talk is getting very um, political science-y and uh, or you know public administration-y, and if you feel um, uh, that you're a bit lost, uh, please let me know. Um, what I've decided to do is, is to sort of take a plunge and um, uh, present to you some initial thoughts that, that occurred uh, to me working uh, on, the, uh, on the governance of the pandemic, as we call it, um, uh, but also that, that, um, that came about because I sat on a... Um, uh, PhD uh, committee, uh, PhD defense committee of a lady at Wageningen University, which is our sort of agricultural science community, uh, university, Wageningen University Research Center. And um, she was, uh, this lady was writing a book on um, how can we safeguard, uh, if you like, the long term uh, in the decisions we make now about uh, certain water governance infrastructural works, for example, and infrastructural investments. You know, in Dutch ter terminology, where do you put the dike? Um, and, and, you know, if you, if you have to make a decision about where to put a, a new dike or which dike to increase or to move or to remove, um, based on, on present day considerations or relatively short term considerations, you make a very different decision uh, than when you factor in uh, longer term considerations, for example, you know, climate change uh, modeling or other considerations about the uh, spatial use uh, and spatial conditions that may prevail uh, in, let's say, the Netherlands uh, in um, uh, maybe half a century from now. So I, I got very interested in the issue of time and if you like the temporal dimension um, in which we um, in which we think and which we allow, if you like, or organize to be um, to be considered uh, in the way we deal with the crisis 
uh, that is facing us now. Um, so the crisis that has been facing us now, that is like the acute crisis of the moment has obviously been COVID. Uh, not exclusively so, we've had a whole range of natural disasters occurring right through the COVID period or industrial disasters or, or what have you. Um, but, but by and large, COVID has been sort of, you know, really the, the dominant acute here and now phenomenon, the here and now threat, the, 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 the real and present danger that we have had to confront. And I got interested in, um, in looking at, if you like, uh, the governance of COVID um, uh, from this kind of shorter, short term, longer term perspective um, through a cartoon. So I'll, I'll show, share the cartoon with you, but also maybe a couple of other uh, slides. Uh, let's see. All goes well, you're able to see my presentation now. Um, so, so uh, how do you govern for the long term in the heat of the moment? That's really the, 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 the kind of um, question that puzzles me right now. Um, and the notion of dual crises, I, I will explain in a second. Um, so the cartoon, um, oh, here, here's the cartoon. This is a cartoon that probably many of you have seen. Um, and it kind of um, suggests that we, at this point in time, are facing, you know, uh, a multiplicity of crises, each of which have different orders of magnitude, but also different, I suppose, temporal orders. So at the time, there was this notion that, you know, the COVID wave is upon us right now, but in its wake will come economic recession. So far, that is not proven um, adequate. Uh, certainly, most countries, uh, their economies have been surprisingly resilient. Although if you go to the global south, you, you will see, um, you know, already that, that this kind of second blue wave uh, is manifesting uh, itself. Uh, and there's possibly uh, worse to come, should the situation in the global south be prolonged. Um, but all of that, those first two waves, you could say, okay, they are a matter of, you know, weeks, months, uh, and a couple of years. Um, the green wave of climate change is, you know, I, I suppose decades. Uh, cr climate change is, uh, I suppose, a creeping crisis, um, which then gives rise to a whole range of acute um, um, uh, extreme weather phenomena, for example. Um, and then behind that is yet another bigger crisis at yet another kind of uh, temporal order. Uh, which is biodiversity collapse. So I'm kind of, I got intrigued by this because what we do and not do, what we decide uh, um, and what we enact in response to COVID, uh, for example, in maintaining our economy, um, also commits us uh, or, or also forges certain pathways that will be relevant to how we deal with uh, climate change and, and you know, those creeping crises of the future. The question is whether we actually take uh, that, that reality into consideration as we make decisions uh, on coping with COVID. So, so that, that, that was kind of, you know, this, this, this thing started to intrigue me uh, back then. And what we know about how we respond to acute crises and, and what the dynamics of acute crises are, is that um, if, if situations are sufficiently threatening and chaotic, et cetera, um, the way in which humans, groups, organizations, uh, maybe entire political systems function um, resembles you know, a form of that Jörg's dot, uh, Dotson curve that you see on the right. So, so it brings out the best in us um, up to a point. And, uh, and if stress is, is too high or too prolonged, um, uh, the reverse happens. And uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of countries in the you know, initial weeks of COVID manifesting itself, so roughly mid-February 2020 uh, up to you know, probably throughout March, April, 
um, that's when most countries, at least in Europe, were really sort of in the grip of this pandemic. I think it's fair to say that there was quite a lot of um, right-hand side of the cur be curve behavior. So not, not great performance when it comes to making sense of the situation, um, making balanced decisions. Just today, there was a pretty damning report uh, in the um, British Parliament uh, tabled about the first months of the UK um, uh, pandemic response, which was uh, captured by um, the herd immunity um, idea, which led through to a, a fairly fatalistic old Eton boys kind of approach that, you know, take it on the chin kind of, um, let's not do too much here. Um, it'll, it'll be rough, but, but it'll blow over. Um, and, you know, it, it was clearly a case of, of, you know, groping for certainty in a highly uncertain situation and landing on something that was convenient. And, and, and importantly, for our purposes, short term. Um, and, and we know from a lot of research uh, that when stress is high enough, there can be this, this sort of collapse of the future uh, in, in the, uh, I suppose, attitude uh, and behavior of decision makers. They are so focused on the here and now uh, because they have to be in a way that they forget to do what governing is supposed to be about, which is also always take into consideration the long run. So the, 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 there are um, circumstances, uh, collective stress, et cetera, that conduce towards sort of short-termism in acute crises. Now, what we know about the dynamics of creeping crises, such as climate change uh, or biodiversity um, collapse, or more social creeping crises like domestic violence, um, or child poverty, or you know, I, I could name a whole range of purely social phenomena. That is, that they are these like slow, slow burning grass fires, if you like, that 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 continue to build and build and build, partly because we fail to really see them for what they are. Um, uh, and therefore we insufficiently address them. That's at least the way in which uh, my colleagues, including two Swedish colleagues, uh, Magnus Ekengren and Mark Reinhardt, along with uh, Arjen Boing, kind of have, have defined cr uh, creeping crises. So they are slow burning, they are allowed to escalate because we're always looking the other way or because we are sort of too busy doing other stuff, uh, if I want to sort of put it in non-technical uh, jargon. Um, so, so as you can see, this kind of sets up a tension. Um, uh, we're in the middle of COVID. If, if uh, my in instinct is right, we are very much sort of focused on, you know, relatively short term, sort of the next month, the next uh, year or so, while, whilst at the same time, there is this kind of grass fire of uh, climate change. Uh, can we do better? Um, uh, and can we find instances where people are either in the midst of responding to the urgent, the urgent threat of today or immediately following a, 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 if you like, standard crisis response recovery operation have the wherewithal to actually take this crisis not just as something that happens in its own right and that needs to be managed, but as a, as a signal, as perhaps a symptom of, of something much bigger, um, uh, longer term that we also need to face. And one example that we discuss in a, in a paper that we are currently circulating um, is the example of Dutch uh, flood management, um, flood risk management. Um, some of you may be quite familiar with this story. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not particularly novel uh, in the water governance community, let's say. But for those of you who aren't in that, in that world, uh, let me just briefly tell you what went on. We had um, two major once in a hundred year flood events within the space of two years uh, in 1993, late 1993 and early 1995. Uh, and um, 
uh, here you see some pictures and you know both of them were pretty big uh, pretty big in terms of damages they did uh, and um, uh, and uh, measures that were needed to keep everybody uh, out of harm's way so a quarter of a million uh, people were evacuated um, there was no shipping for a week millions of cattle had to be evacuated as well significant economic disruption disruption to community life uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. and those events you know the the conventional risk modelers that said you know there's only you know the odds of this happening are are very low uh, and yet they they happened uh, and it was like a double punch and what this this brought about was kind of an awareness in in Dutch society, in the political system, but certainly also in the water governance community, that this may be the shape of things to come, that maybe those conventional risk models uh, were no longer to be uh, believed uh, or relied upon. Uh, and maybe we needed to, to stare the bigger crisis of uh, soil erosion uh, upstream in the Alps in particular, uh, which really compromises uh, the ability of, of um, you know, that, that um, mountain system to, to retain water uh, when there's mass precipitation. Uh, so the combination of, of erosion upstream and climate change, which is going to produce more uh, extreme downpours and more sustained uh, downpours uh, across Western Europe, maybe we should sort of face the reality of that. And if you live in a country um, such as mine, I'm currently speaking to you from five meters below currency levels, you can, you can imagine that this is, you know, not something to, to be taken lightly. This is existential uh, for, for at least uh, two thirds, if not more of Dutch territory and probably more than three quarters of our population and 80% of our economy. Um, so we did, and, and uh, there's a whole story, backstory to be told, which I will not uh, engage in, but what this in effect did, this double punch of those two disasters and the political and policy attention it generated about uh, you know, the shape of things to come was nothing less than a paradigm shift in, in how we keep ourselves safe. Not just from the sea, this was particularly about um, the, the riverine systems. These were riverine floods. Um, and, and we basically have started to shed a, a more than thousand year old paradigm of, you know, getting safety through concrete and mud and, and bricks, uh, etc. You know, uh, flood, flood hazard management equals dike building. Whereas what we've been moving towards is not is a system where we don't fight against the water and use that kind of you know, engineering approach to doing that, uh, but, but uh, move towards adaptive water management, which entails making space for water. So actually moving dikes outward uh, to give, um, give the water space, but also changing land use patterns. Uh, and if you like making deals with landowners, um, to, to create spaces for the water to go safely uh, when needed so that uh, other areas where it, it had better not go um, remain dry. So this, this has been, if you like, a um, de-sectoralization of, of water governance. All of a sudden, we've had to involve other sectors of society. We've had to involve local governments and a whole range of other actors that weren't normally at play here. Um, and this has been a 25 year or 20 year effort um, that is still ongoing, um, uh, but has been, uh, by the look of it, remarkably successful already. Uh, as you may recall, there were some pretty nasty flood events in our part of the world a couple of months ago, uh, very bad in, in Germany uh, and Belgium in particular, in the same riverine systems that, that, that uh, go through our country. We had except for one locality, we had no problems whatsoever. And the water went where it was supposed to go um, under this kind of new regime. So um, uh, if you then start to analyze how was this possible, um, it was possible be because of a combination of these, these kind of factors that played up in that kind of immediate 
crisis period and post-crisis period in 1995 in particular. So we were starting to see the crisis not as a one-off, but as a symptom. Um, certain people who had, uh, and, and, and players, if you like, in water governance, who had, had always, or who had been arguing for a long time that we needed to rethink our approach, exploited the events of the moment to forge onto agendas, new definitions of the problem, and also uh, uh, advocacy of new uh, solutions, or even previously thought up solutions that had never made it uh, to political uh, decisions. Um, uh, the use of, you know, uh, commissions of inquiry, uh, stacking the deck of those inquiries in a way that sort of would forge this kind of new long-term perspective on the agenda. Uh, and, and also making certain innovations in the way we make water governance policy. Um, they, they appointed a kind of a water czar uh, in our country uh, who has a 50 year remit uh, and can spend about 1 billion uh, euros a year. Um, uh, not unilaterally, but who, who works as a kind of connective professional, um, a connective um, collaborative governance engineer, so to speak. Uh, we call him the Delta Commissioner. Uh, so no, not much unilateral power, only a bit of money to play with, uh, and basically direct reporting to Parliament, uh, which has, has proven to be a very effective uh, um, method of getting people's attention and getting players to come to the party. Um, so um, to me, this is an example of what, what, what I now st have started to think of as time-sensitive governance. Um, time-sensitive governance of dual crises, acute and creeping at the same time. Uh, and uh, on the right-hand side, you see this, this PhD dissertation that I was talking about, Deciding for Tomorrow Today, um, defended at Wageningen University last year. On the left, you see a book that I've been, um, you know, using as a, as a Bible for a very long time uh, by two Harvard uh, people, uh, thinking in time. This is really about uh, how can we use uh, history to think about present day uh, problems in a responsible, if you like, non-rhetorical, but more analytical and, 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 and systematic uh, manner. So that's a way of uh, looking back uh, in time in order to be able to look forward uh, and, and govern with prudence uh, in the present and, and moving forward. Uh, whereas these two other books are more about how can we create incentives in governance systems to factor in uh, the long term uh, uh, when, when that's not the normal order of things. Uh, and, and so in a way, we, we've come, my co-authors and I, and, and Mika Pot, uh, who defended that thesis, is one of the co-authors, we, we started to, to play around with what, when we study cases like the Dutch one, um, what, what kind of strategies do we see? Uh, and what might be components of a dual a dual crisis um, uh, governance capacity. One is to, to, to have capacity uh, for anticipation and for crafting longer time horizons, for injecting, if you like, uh, the renew, the blue bit, in the more familiar um, red and yellow zones of response and recovery, which are typically you know, the routines that we, uh, that we have for dealing with acute crises. How can you, whilst you're busy responding and recovering, build attention for the renewal, which has a much longer kind of timeline and, and a much larger zone of uncertainty? So part of this is about encouraging policymakers to, to use scenario modeling, et cetera, techniques that are very familiar uh, when you do long range policymaking, but that are not very uh, readily used uh, or attended to in the midst uh, of an acute crisis. Secondly, um, there's this whole notion of timing, striking uh, while the iron is hot, using policy windows, or if you like, eating the banana at, uh, you know, at the optimum point of ripeness. Um, and there's no doubt 
that um, this, this double punch of two unexpected flood events uh, with very significant uh, damage uh, served or created the conditions for a policy window, a window of opportunity opening, which means uh, in a way that the, the, the language and the proponents of the old order the old way of doing things, in this case, the old way or the established way of water governance, particularly riverine flood safety governance, um, that, that they are temporarily weakened um, by the incidence of unexpected events or events that, 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 that were um, not, not able to be prevented by the existing policy frameworks. So, so in, in public policy, we speak of policy windows when there's all of a sudden a very high level of attention, both societal, political and institutional attention for a certain issue. Um, and and the, the characteristics of a poly, policy window is that it may open, but it, it also closes. So therefore timing, you know, use striking while the iron is, is hot, opening the bottom drawer and bringing out plans that nobody wanted to hear about uh, previously, but now everybody is groping around for, is, is one of those kind of strategies. Um, so a good example, another example of this uh, is um, gun control. Uh, in Australia, in back in 1990, Six, we had the, the then largest um, mass shooting by an, 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 an individual in the world. Uh, it happened in Tasmania. It was one guy who shot about 46 people and wounded dozens of other people. Um, this led, within a month, it led to one of the most ambitious gun control schemes and, and gun buyback schemes um, that the world has ever seen. Uh, which produced, um, you know, remarkable results in bringing down, um, you know, incidents of gun deaths, uh, uh, etc. And which since then has kept those gun deaths um, at a very low level. So this was not just the product, uh, and that's important here about timing, of an ad hoc, if you like, bleeding heart response to a terrible event. Um, this was people who had been waiting for an opportunity to push legislative initiatives that they had been designing uh, and arguing for for a long time, but that were always resisted by uh, agricultural lobby in particular and, and shooters lobbies, you know, uh, recreational shooters lobbies, which are very strong in, in countries like Australia, which have significant rural constituencies. But that incident changed. Uh, public attention on the uh, levels of public attention on the issue uh, and it was possible to 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 have these out of the box long term approaches um the third out of four strategies oh sorry are we already at the fourth did i become over enthusiastic oh yeah here's the third one the third one is about pacing the work so there's the metaphor of the accelerator and the brake you know it's it's one thing to to get people's attention focused on a creeping crisis on the longer term. Um, but you can also push things too far. Um, and when you push things too far, when you, when you create a, you know, a level of unease that is too high for people to contemplate, i.e. fear of climate change, for example, if you, if you whip it up too far, uh, what we know will happen is that there's going to be a lot of pushback. Uh, people want to bring the stress level down by blaming the source of the information, by maybe derailing the discussion. Um, so you get a kind of a, a pattern of work avoidance. Uh, and, and so pacing the work of moving people's attention um, from the, the, the urgent crisis of the moment to the much bigger a uh, creeping crisis that this, the crisis of the moment is a symptom of, uh, is, is very delicate work. It kind of involves coalition building. It, it, it involves reading the tea leaves about what society will wear um, and what coalitions are able to be formed at what point in time. Um, so when you see the figure on the left uh, suggesting that, you know, the longer we wait, 
with adjusting to a particular technology, doesn't matter which one, the larger the cost of doing so, that may be true, and that is certainly true for climate change. Um, um, the, pol the political reality is, is, is if you use the accelerator too abundantly um, uh, early on, uh, you may not get anywhere at all. Um, so it's a very, very delicate uh, balancing act. So this notion of pacing the work of, of um, long-term focused crisis responses uh, is, is what we are on about here. Then finally, there's this notion of, and I think that's more familiar ground in this audience, this notion of iterative adaptation. So not just the big master plan that we're kind of rolling out for 50 years, but a kind of iterative approach that uses feedback uh, loops uh, and, and that uses, if you like, smart incrementalism uh, to keep working towards long-term goals without um, um, getting locked into today's uh, mode, predominant mode of thinking. Um, so those are the four sort of strategies or uh, ideas that we've come up with. And just wrapping up my introduction, um, you know, what are the research implications of this? Um, I'm, I'm not completely sure uh, yet, you know, as you as you probably have gathered, this is very much a, um, a first set of thoughts. But uh, I, I think I would like to do more systematic comparative work of, if you like, myopic and non-myopic, uh, nearsighted and farsighted uh, crisis uh, responses. So the Dutch case would, would be a farsighted one. Um, uh, I could also give you other Dutch cases which are extremely nearsighted. Uh, and to then compare those in, within the same political system, ideally even within the same sector, would, would, would yield presumably some insights about what are the preconditions for these strategies and maybe other strategies of time-sensitive governance um, being deployed or not being deployed, being, being used or being blocked. So ultimately, we, 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 we would want to, to do that, this type of work and, and, and perhaps also move towards um, you know, collaborative work with government agencies to experiment with, with some of these strategies when, when the next acute crisis uh, comes along. I'll stop there, Suzanne, and I'll happily take uh, questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Paul, for this very uh, interesting, fascinating, sophisticated uh, uh, model of, of plant research. Um, that was great. And thank you for keeping time. We have approximately 10 minutes for, for questions or comments. Uh, I think in this audience, you will find plenty of people working on the disaster risk reduction paradigm, which I think is sort of where you're heading, uh, what, what you're talking about when you talk about uh, getting out of the crisis induced paradigm. Uh, uh, speaking of vulnerability, speaking of risk reduction, uh, and that implies a more long-term uh, thinking in, 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 in longer terms, and another temporal scale, I would say. Exactly. Uh, right, thank you. So let's see, uh, I can give the word to Ricardo Biela to pose his question directly to Paul. Uh, yeah, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yes, I can. Hi, Ria. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, about uh, um, uh, international coordination. I think this is a case which is, uh, especially when it comes to water management, it's quite common. Um, I imagine that uh, the case which you presented for the Netherlands, um, of course, the Netherlands is not an isolated system. Instead, it will the, 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 the rivers running through it run also through Germany. Um, but uh, how, and, and certainly this is the case for, uh, for COVID as well, where um, um, one country's um, uh, strategy can impact or amplify the crisis in another country. Like, how do you envision um, um, this kind of flexible and um, uh, flexible type of govern governance when it comes to to, to international um, cooperation. Yes, uh, thanks very much, uh, Ricardo. 
Um, yeah, there's an interesting twist to the case example I used because uh, one of the epiphanies of uh, the 1993 floods was that uh, we thought we had good collaboration on, for example, early warning about um, movement of water down the, you know, this kind of multinational uh, river basin, the River Rhine and the River Meuse in particular. Um, but uh, the reality was we didn't, you know, the water in 1993 came as a surprise because the Belgians and the Germans were not telling us it was coming, it was coming down the way it was coming down. Um, I'm, I'm not blaming them, I'm just uh, observing a fact. Um, and, and so one of the implications of th this event happening was that we were made aware of our interdependencies. And, and I'm sure we, we, we have always been in a way, but, but sometimes, you know, it takes a, a major incident like this uh, to also have a wake up call about the larger set of dependencies uh, that, that you, you are prone to, you know, uh, our dike building uh, approach, you know, is, is completely futile if we do not also at the same time cooperate um, about all, all kinds of um, um, aspects of the governance of these water systems uh, with our upstream, uh, in this case, upstream uh, neighbors. Um, so I am not sure on, on, on this particular case, um, to what extent the events of 1993 and 1995 have also uh, produced an intensification um, of, uh, if you like, international policy coordination on this, particularly on the sort of mitigation side. Um, but, but I will definitely go and check. Um, what we do know, of course, Ricardo, is that, that sometimes it can be hard enough to kind of get the wheels of national level policy making going uh, in a, in a far-sighted manner in response to a crisis let alone um, uh, an international one. I think a lot depends on, is there a pre-existing, is there a pre-existing regime of regular exchange and expertise, you know, sharing of expertise? Uh, is there a degree of unity or is it a very contested uh, space uh, between nations? Uh, I think that will make a great uh, difference. But um, thank you for pointing out this, this kind of international dimension uh, that I hadn't really factored in uh, into my uh, considerations uh, at all. So thanks very much. Thank you. More questions or comments to Paul? Maybe I can, oh, Stephanie, yeah, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for uh, an interesting talk. You always provide some thought-provoking ideas, and I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to ask, today, the forum, one of the aims of the forum is bridging this between theory uh, and practice, and you spoke about how we can improve sense-making uh, in order to make, have better governance and govern better decision-making. Um, and this morning, we were had um, the morning session with practitioners, and they were some, one of the issues we that was raised was the um, amount of research that's done. And it's difficult sometimes for practitioners to consume and to process all of that research. And I know that you have worked quite closely in this meeting between practitioners and researchers. And I just would like you to share some of your experiences and suggestions on, on how we can improve that dialogue between um, researchers and practitioners. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I noticed that there's a couple of other questions. Do you want me to take them all in one go, uh, Suzanne, or do I go one um, by one? Maybe, yeah, you one and Tobias, would you like to pose your questions and then Paul can maybe tie them into to one single answer. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much, Paul, for a very interesting uh, uh, lecture or, or, or uh, uh, sharing of, of experience. So um, I am from the Karolinska Institute, uh, mm -hmm. from uh, the Center for Research on Healthcare in Disasters. And I was particularly interested in this, um, you know, how to prepare uh, in advance. And uh, specifically, I'd like to refer to a recently published paper where they 
assessed um, uh, health systems preparedness to to manage uh, pandemics and uh, you know there's the international health regulations which is uh, they can assess the capacity to uh, to which extent the, the country is abating to the to um, uh, to those regulations and you know by measuring preparedness and there's also a specialist assessment that's been going on before uh, the pandemic uh, as well as surveillance data and these three categories to to check to what extent um, systems were prepared, health systems were prepared uh, for the pandemic, showed up to predict not at all uh, to what extent the health systems managed to deal with the COVID. On the contrary, United States was considered to be the, the best one adhering to international health regulations and turned out to be uh, the ones performing the worst of all countries. So how could you know decision maker rely on this uh, preparedness or the systems we have if they're not capable of really uh, um, showing us what is needed at, at the time of, of when we have a disaster. Do you have any sort of reflections on this? Because there, I mean, I think the previous question was a bit uh, similar. And, and uh, uh, so I just wanted to hear your, your point on this. How, because, you know, how do we prepare for the unexpected and we create these very, you know, fancy uh, systems, but then maybe these systems are not at all capable to, to detect and, and also tell us in advance what's, what's, what's happening. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And then we have a, another practitioner, Tobias from Jungbu yep. Municipality. Yes, and I will post have asked a different question, I feel like, because um, I'm more interested in like from the 93 and 95 experiences there. Uh, how was it ensured that the longevity of the project continued, considering I almost want to post a very um, well, in, in some sense, disturbing questions is, is democracy decremental to disaster risk reduction? Mm. Considering our election cycle, four years and so forth, and our poor memories of the previous, like, why did you still remember the floods in 97, in 99, in, in 2000? Why, mm. why the program was ongoing to 2015? That's 20 years. How did you succeed in that? Yep. That easy question I'd love to have answered. <laughs> Fantastic, Tobias. And um, if you want to, I, uh, if you, you can contact me afterwards, I can send you one or two papers uh, that give a fuller answer. Not, not my own papers, but papers that I know are very good on this subject. But um, so I'll take them in kind of reverse order, these questions. Start with Tobias's. And I'll be brief, Susan. I know that you, you're probably heading for a break or something. But um, um, yes, we, we did take some of the politics out of uh, this effort. I mentioned the appointment of this kind of water czar, um, uh, the Delta commissioner, who is a non-political figure, um, not subject to the political cycle. Uh, they're, uh, they're appointed for six year terms. Um, they are appointed directly by uh, the minister. Uh, the ministers can't fire them, however, they can only appoint them. Um, and so, um, uh, and they, they, they have this kind of uh, statutory uh, role to ensure we still have a country in 50 years. Um, so, so, you know, the, the, the long, they are guardians of the long term in an already crowded, a populate, a, a crowded policy space where most of the actors are uh, in it for the short term except perhaps for Rijkswaterstaat, which is the, 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 the civil engineering organization in the Netherlands, which is also used to think, you know, very, very long term. So in other words, it wasn't by chance, but it was by intervening in the actual governance arrangements and introducing a player not subject to the vagaries of the electoral slash democratic cycle, but still, um, reporting to the the ultimate democratic authority which is the parliament uh, so it was not like we created some mini dictator or something uh, but we injected somebody who was a guardian of the long term um johan's question on um this kind of paradox that the on paper best prepared countries uh, didn't do so well in the response to me that's kind of vintage uh, wildowski uh, Aaron Wildowski, he wrote this book in 1988, it's called uh, Searching for Safety, where he suggests there is an, a, a real, a real trade-off between banking on anticipation 
um, sort of second guessing the risk uh, picture and trying to to prevent as much as possible, and if not, you know, be prepared uh, through a whole set of, I suppose, rules and regulations and plans. On the one hand, and the strategy of resilience, which is sort of to have the wherewithal to improvise, to to absorb a shock and bounce back from it, uh, which which is premised on, you know, flexibility. Uh, decentralization of authority, um, uh, shedding the illusion uh, of control, uh, etc. And 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 so uh, I'm I'm a big fan of that book. Uh, I know it was a very controversial book at the time, but um, uh, I think the events of COVID, of early COVID, uh, seem to be teaching us that there may uh, have been such a paradox in operation. Uh, in in pandemic preparedness, uh, certainly in some of the more sophisticated, I suppose, jurisdictions, um, that the, the idea that we are well prepared then then becomes a driver of uh, re reduced uh, capacity for resilience, um, um, and um, you know, in, in my country, I can say that. Um, we have one of the, the most efficient and leanest health systems in the world, and we were never shy of congratulating ourselves on it. Uh, the unintended consequence of, of it was that we had very, very little uh, IC capacity uh, when we most needed it, which was a fatal, fatal flaw in our you know, architecture, in our, in our capacity for resilience. Uh, when it was needed. So I think the answer to your question is somewhere in, in investigating this paradox. Um, and certainly, you know, the Dutch case that I was mentioning is also evidence of that paradox. We thought we had it covered uh, with our dike system and our thousand year old system of, you know, the envy of the world in, 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 in water governance uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and yet that very assumption of safety and that very reliance on all these preventative arrangements actually made us quite weak in 95, in 93. Uh, we were a lot better in, in 95 because 93 had been the wake up call. Oh, we better get our flood response capacity uh, up uh, as well. Um, and then finally, um, uh, Stephanie's question. Um, look, I, I'm kind of over the sender receiver model of uh, engaging with practitioners. I think we need, uh, and, and it's, I know it's incredibly hard and sometimes frustrating work, but I'm, I'm very much in, in this mode of getting, getting into dialogue with practitioners about um, uh, what questions are worth investigating in the first place and going for a partnership approach, if you like, at the front end of the research process, rather than hoping you can drag practitioners in, in the room, kicking and screaming when, when you have found something that you, you think is of interest uh, to them. So I think we should, should really, um, you know, be prepared to walk the tightrope of engaging with, let's say, governmental actors, for example, at the front end, you know, almost at the borderline of uh, of seeing our, I suppose, our academic independence uh, constrained. Um, I, I'm very happy to be trading off on some questions I don't get to ask, uh, if the questions I do get to ask um, have the um, and, and questions that I do feel are incredibly important and you know worth worthwhile to pursue from an academic point of view, if those questions also have priority attention from policymakers who are then in a position to actually do something uh, with the results of my research down down the track. Uh, so, so my answer to your question is engage early on uh, and be prepared for the kind of the give and take uh, that that entails. Currently, we are waiting for a decision by a Dutch government, um, uh, the, our, our kind of National Science Foundation, on a 20 million euro uh, application we've got in, which is about increasing our adaptive capacity in response to crises that are transboundary. Um, uh, so, so part of that application has been extensive work 
with uh, policy communities to bring them in as partners in, in what we propose to do, which is to create an academy, uh, if you like, a plateau style academy, um, uh, rather than a, you know, a, a kind of uh, contemporary academy. And I think the, the, the characteristic of a plateau style academy was this very free exchange uh, of, of all walks of life who participated in, in the academy. <laughs> not just you know an ivory tower set of academics uh, doing their thing and then hoping for uh, a reception so so that would be my answer uh, sorry to have gone a bit long uh, Suzanne. no problem at all all very interesting questions and and also your uh, your answers and to the point of ending on that note before the break uh, on the construction of knowledge and how we produce knowledge and how we how we build that together in in society considering different interests and conflicts of interests and, and all that, of course. And that is what also what we're going to uh, touch upon in the uh, panel discussion in, in a while. But I do think we need a break. Uh, so 10 minutes break and we meet again at 15.30 uh, at uh, yeah half past three. Uh, so don't leave, just take your break and come back. I hope you'll stay with us, Paul, for, for the rest of the afternoon. Thank Thanks. you. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. There we go. I hope you're back after having stretched your legs, got a cup of coffee or something. Um, I now have the pleasure to introduce our uh, next presenter, um, who is uh, Elena Rafetti. Uh, Elena is a medical doctor, uh, a PhD in epidem epidemiology, if I'm correct, uh, and specialized in public health medicine and also mental health problems among adolescents. Um, Elena is currently one of the postdoctoral scholars that Giuliani mentioned um, uh, at CNDS, uh, doing comparative research on epidemic risk perception uh, in Italy and uh, Sweden during the COVID-19 pandemic. She is also a postdoc at uh, the University of Cambridge uh, in the UK, where she is undertaking research on adverse pregnancy outcomes following the COVID-19 infection. Um, and I guess uh, this is what you're going to share with us today, the, the, the CNDS related research on the comparative uh, uh, studies between Sweden and, and Italy, and uh, those are two, uh, you're working on two publications uh, um, that are, you're preparing, uh, one called Multiple Hazards and Risk Perceptions Over Time, uh, the Availability Heuristic in Italy and Sweden under COVID-19, and the other one, the Epidemic Risk Perceptions in Italy and Sweden, driven by authority responses to covid 19. So we're eager to hear what this is about. And I leave the floor to you, Elena. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me today. I think that now you can see my screen. Uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, I'm happy to introduce today the results of this study and to discuss the uh, role of this perception for on uh, epidemic misperception and other ads are during the current epidemic. But uh, uh, the first question is, why is uh, public misperception important? And uh, as you can see from this uh, framework, uh, there are different kinds of factors that are influencing this perception. The awareness, the experience, the prepare, the knowledge are influ influencing this perception that uh, is uh, also influencing and shaping the frequency uh, and the intensity of different kinds of, uh, of hazard that interact with uh, environmental changes at, in turn, the impact and the experience of hazard is, uh, uh, in turn, uh, shape also the perception of the risk itself. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, a good example of this because it's reshaping the risk perception of epidemics and also of the other answer. And on this, I think, are of interest the results of this cross-country comparison that uh, we have done between uh, Italy and Sweden. And we have uh, included 
2,000 individuals in uh, Sweden, 2,000 individuals in Italy. Uh, there is another sample in the capital region, so in Stockholm region and Lazio region, that is the region of Rome. And this survey has uh, uh, run uh, three times in, in the last year and a half. In grey, you see the number of COVID cases. So uh, we have uh, asked questions uh, on the survey on this uh, representative sample of the Italian population and on the Swedish population in two periods of uh, with a, a low pandemic uh, uh, intensity. So uh, low infection rate like August uh, 2020 and August 2021 and a period with a high infection rate like November 2020. And uh, uh, the question that mainly we, the data that mainly we collect were about uh, different kinds of hazard from epidemics, uh, uh, flow drugs. Uh, so uh, it's uh, around 10 hazard. And in the last survey, we also include the air pollution. And we look different dimension risk perception, experience, the preparing, the knowledge. And we also collected in the, uh, information on the individual, on the social demographic characteristics. And uh, uh, here is a, a figure. I don't know if you know what is a stringency index. The stringency index is an index uh, that evaluates the level of restriction that uh, are being imposed in the countries during the COVID-19 pandemics. And as a measure of restriction, I intended uh, closing restaurants, closing schools, lockdowns that uh, uh, we have seen in Italy, we face in Italy where people couldn't leave their, uh, their, uh, their home, their apartment. And this index go from zero, that is the minimum, to 100. And the interesting things about compare Sweden and Italy is uh, uh, have been two countries, both very affected by the pandemic, but they use a different response. Uh, Sweden has been uh, mainly, the response has been, has been mainly driven by recommendation also due to the history uh, of Sweden in response to crisis. And Italy, uh, more about restriction. And you see here that the stringency index is very high in Italy, especially in the, set, in the first uh, waves of the pandemic. And also last winter has been quite uh, high in Italy. So the level of restriction was uh, quite high. But um, let's move on and the focus of some results. So uh, one of the paper that uh, we, it's now under review and that uh, we are uh, studied the epidemic risk perception in the Italian and the Swedish context. Here you can see the risk perception scale that go between zero to five, uh, but uh, the mean here you have the mean for the likelihood that an epidemic occur, occur the impact on the individual, uh, the, the individual knowledge on the epidemic and the authority knowledge. And here you, you see the mean uh, of, the, of the population in Sweden in green and in Italy in blue. Uh, what we are not really, we are not very interested in the, in, I can say in the absolute number, but in how this, uh, per this perception change over time. So between August 2020, that is a period with a low uh, infection rate. Uh, so the pandemic, there was a low spreading of the COVID pandemic and uh, November 2020. And here we are. And uh, what is interesting that the likelihood, so the likelihood of occurrence of a pandemic uh, in Italy that was very affected in the first period, and they also um, introduced a lot of restrictive measures already in October, November, closing school. There is a higher increase of the likelihood compared to Sweden. Also, the impact remained quite high with a higher imposed measure. And there is also something interesting that we can learn from the difference about the individual knowledge and the authority knowledge. As you can see in Sweden, uh, there is that the authority knowledge is higher than the individual knowledge of the epidemic. At least the perception of the authority knowledge is higher than the perception of the individual knowledge. Why uh, in Italy, uh, the individual knowledge is perceived higher than the authority knowledge and the authority knowledge in the second phase uh, quite reduced. So it's, uh, we can read this as that there has been a reduction in the trust in the authority when uh, we had the second wave of the pandemic in November. But let's move on and see something else very interesting. Here we have uh, excess mortality in the first wave. So between March and May 2020, uh, and uh, the excess mortality, so 
the increase of mortality compared to the, the year before. And you can see in, uh, in that in Sweden, we have Stockholm was quite hit during the first uh, phase. And uh, in Italy, mainly the Lombardy region. And we studied the, the, according to the regional level, the likelihood uh, of the occurrence, the perceived likelihood of the occurrence. And what we were expecting to see is what uh, in the places, um, the care regions more affected, there was a higher per perception of the likelihood. But it was not like this. It was quite homogeneous, as you can see here in, Swe in Sweden and in Italy, because probably the, the likelihood, uh, it was not driven by the excess mortality and the number of the cases, but more by the uh, restriction that uh, has been imposed. Because, for example, in Italy, with uh, this was this called lockdown with non-pharmacological intervention was the same in Lombardy region than in Sicily that was uh, very little affected in the first wave. So this is an overview of the, our results on the epidemic misperception. But uh, I think that it's very important to remember that uh, during the, the current pandemic uh, is, uh, is important to, to think that there are other hazards that can affect uh, uh, the, the, our society. So it's important to have a, a global view and think about multiple hazards and misperception. As you know, Italy and Sweden has been affected differently by, by the disaster in the last 14 years. You can see here the number are inequivocal will say that in Italy we are being affected more than in Sweden. And here it's a, 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 a picture on the likelihood of the, of the, of the risk perception, uh, of, of likelihood of the, of the occurrence of the event, and uh, on the X axis, the percentage of respondents who reported experience of the event. And as I explained before, uh, epidemics, it seems that uh, between August 2020 and November 2020, so this is the, a low, uh, low, low uh, infection rate and a high infection rate. And you can see that, uh, as we see before, there is an increase of the perception of the likelihood more in Italy than in, than in, uh, than in Sweden. But what is also interesting is that in Italy is also a uh, main role, the economic crisis that increase the, the likelihood uh, and also climate change as in Sweden, because also Italy, like the economic crisis, we know that uh, the public debt is quite high. So uh, there is a perception from the population that there is a high risk of economic crisis. And from this, from this picture, we can also see some seasonal trend that are very interesting. Let's see, for example, wildfires that are quite common in Sweden during the summer. And there is a reduction between, uh, between uh, the winter and the summer. And the same for the for drought. Also here we see a reduction due to a seasonal trend. And the last thing that I think it's interesting also to see is the terror attack in Sweden. We know that Sweden faced terror attack a few years ago. And this survey has been run just before, uh, just after the terroristic attack in, uh, in, uh, in Austria. And so we see that it's real, there is a small increase of, uh, of, um, of the likelihood of terror attack uh, between the first and the second wave. And this is an overview of uh, the perception of multiple hazards during the current pandemic in a period with a, a low infection rate to a period with a high infection rate. And uh, what next? As I said, that we are uh, collecting data also in uh, August uh, 2021. And all of us uh, is hoping now that we are going towards uh, uh, what we can call endemic phase of, uh, of uh, COVID-19. So where uh, we will not see outbreaks and we will see a uh, constant number of cases. So we are hoping not to see the waves that we have faced last winter in Sweden and the last winter in Italy. And to do this, uh, we know that uh, vaccination is very important. We in human beings has produced in uh, incredibly short time uh, in vaccines that are really working uh, against uh, the COVID-19 infection. Uh, so yeah, to, 
there are some factors that can influence the, the vaccine adherence that are the trust in the authority, uh, the risk of the disease, the risk of the perception of the disease, and how people perceive the vaccination safety. Uh, above them, I think it's also important to remember, and I will remember at the end, that uh, uh, we are looking this on a perspective of European countries that have doses of vaccine. Uh, we really need to work uh, in public health uh, uh, and uh, uh, as a uh, as high income country for equal distribution of vaccine because there are several countries that do not have access to them. And uh, here are some results on the role of risk perception and adherence to the vaccination campaign. Uh, we ask people if they were vaccinated with uh, at least one dose of COVID-19 uh, vaccine, yes or no, and we look the relationship between different uh, items of risk perception and uh, the um, vaccine and vaccination adherence. This is a specific terminological uh, epidemiological term, odds ratio, but uh, I will say that we can interpret this that a person that, uh, that thinks that authority have a higher knowledge so they know a lot, they have a, a double probability to be vaccinated. And what is interesting in, in this uh, picture is that uh, uh, there is a, 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 an important uh, role of authority knowledge. So if I trust the authority, uh, I probably uh, adhere more uh, and I, I'm going to do my vaccine. Uh, looking at the likelihood and the individual impact, the likelihood there's an effect in Sweden and the individual impact that some effect in Italy. But the individual knowledge seems not uh, have uh, an effect on the adherence to the vaccination campaigning. And coming to the conclusion, I think that uh, with these results, uh, we need to remember that uh, a pandemic can be quite long. So community engagement is very important if we want that people adhere to the recommendation. And we, have, uh, we need to have a line of trust between policymaker, uh, politicians and uh, the community. And all of this should be seen in a complex scenario. I also think it has been said today, but uh, uh, there are a different kind of uh, of interest that play a role. And we need to look uh, not only in, in a short term, but a long term, and to look at our role as a scientist in this. And I really would like to thank the multidisciplinary team that work on, on this data and on this publication. And thanks all of you that have been today listening to the presentation. And please be in contact, uh, you have our mail uh, our uh, contact if you want to know more about this or if you want to collaborate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elena. Very interesting and very recent, fresh data that you've analyzed. Uh, we have a few minutes if uh, somebody has a comment or a question to Elena on, on behalf of the whole team uh, and, and as a presenter. Um, Feel free to raise your hand or write, write in the chat. Maybe I can ask you the, the very obvious question why you picked Sweden and Italy. The obvious <laughs> that you're working in Sweden and you come from Italy, but I mean, what are the other uh, criteria for? No, no, I, I, it's, it's true, I should be told that I have been involved after they choose the two countries. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, no, no, but, I, yeah, I, what's the rationale? <laughs> but uh, I think it's been a, um, a quite good choice. I think Italy and Sweden has uh, like this difference in how to cope with the pandemic is quite exemplary. Uh, Italy has been like the first big outbreaks in Europe uh, and is closed completely because they see how there was overwhelmed the healthcare system, while Sweden has been one of the few countries that uh, didn't close at all. So I think they are really in the opposite uh, strategies uh, around Europe. I think this is uh, quite interesting. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Andrea, you have a question or comment? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Elena, for the very interesting presentation. You know already that I'm super fascinated by the topic. And it's a little bit building on, my question is building a bit on Susan's question previously, because I was also trying to do uh, a comparison more or less uh, during my master's studies, but I, I chose like two very opposing countries, which was like Sweden and Vanuatu. And the problem that I faced when I was doing the study was that the differences were so big. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, and it again deals a bit on Suzanne's question, what is the, did, did you, I'm oh, sorry, now I realize that you will hear me better. Um, uh, did you, or what are the 
what could you identify as the, um, I don't know, points of convergence between the two in like, is it like, would, would you see similarities if you wouldn't have chosen an, another European country, like trying to go beyond Europe? Uh, I can say that uh, uh, I have done something like this in my PhD studies to include Italy and Sweden for a study and also including another, another, another country. But I think that there are, since there are two European countries, there are lots of similarities uh, between Italy and Sweden. And also Italy and Sweden are two countries that have a, a high number of cases. They are quite being affected if you look at the excess mortality, uh, especially during, uh, during the first wave. Uh, sure, it will be very interesting to have a third country to compare the misperception and you see how differences uh, in the society can, can shape it. The fact that it's both in the European Union, uh, you, can access, you can access similar data. So you have homogeneous data on the number of cases, on the vaccination prevalence, but it will be outside the European Union. I'm not sure that you can have data that are homogenized in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, Elisa, please go ahead. Hello, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Elena, for the nice uh, and clear, very clear presentation. I was uh, just curious of uh, hearing from you if you were. Um, if you were supposed to write a policy paper or uh, um, advice uh, after your study, what would be your recommendation uh, for the municipality or the government to, or the region to handle uh, future crises uh, in the short time? Uh, this is a very important question. I don't know if I'm the right person to answer to this, uh, but uh, my feeling, at least uh, from the beginning as a public health doctor, has been that uh, uh, everybody was dealing with this pandemic as was uh, been a war, uh, and they were putting restriction, uh, forgetting that it was very important to have uh, to center, to have uh, the community as a center to the response, to that people were understanding why we needed to, to have that kind of restriction. And uh, you are probably not following the Italian media, but we are seeing now uh, some problems because people are not accepting some uh, mandatory, uh, um, uh, now it's mandatory to have like uh, the vaccine to go to work and so on. And that being like cases of, uh, of like uh, a lot of demonstration uh, in Rome during the last weekend. And I think this is also, a, we need to remember that it's important that uh, the community is the center for this, the, for, the, for, for a pandemic. It's something that can be long for one, two, three years or more. Thank you. Is your, do you want to comment on that, Elisa, or is your hand just up? Okay. I'm, I'm fine with that, okay. thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Yes. And I guess this goes back to uh, what uh, some of the questions to Paul about uh, about democracy, participation, expertise, the role of expertise and and how that plays out in this uh, uh, in this setting. OK, and I will give the word to Ricardo as a final question and then we will prepare for the panel discussion. Ricardo, go ahead. Hi, um, a quick question. Um, I'm also another Italian in Sweden, so I was extremely interesting uh, um, to hear um, to hear your research. Um, I wanted to ask how much um, do you think that the trust in authority and the trust as a consequence of trust in the vaccine is uh, kind of eroded by how um, the way in which the Italian government and the Swedish government have, um, have treated their own citizen. Like I think there is a bit of a fundamental difference in the way in which the Swedish government has a lot tried to work with the citizen, while in many ways the Italian government seem to have tried to work against uh, its own citizen. Like, of course, like uh, imposing top-down restrictions is uh, the main the main example. Absolutely, I think it's a very interesting question, Ricardo. I think that to quantify it, uh, we could probably need to put the main determinants and to try to understand which is. Uh, 
uh, as a, a higher um, a higher weight on this because authority trust can can be related to a lot of things. But what I'm thinking is more not only how the governments are working together with or against their own citizens, but I think it's also the role in the past years. If you think about vaccination adherence, has been quite high in Sweden for a long time. So it's like that uh, the, the Swedish population trusts the Swedish government. Uh, the Italian population uh, does not. Like, uh, I think this is a, a history that really public health in Italy really needs to work more on vaccination willingness. We have seen in, in the past year with some measles outbreaks in Naples that uh, because the, the covert was going down also on kids. So I think this is something that uh, we need to renew. Taking something from the presentation of from poll presentation, we probably re need to rethink part uh, of our uh, preventive medicine that it's uh, quite strong in Sweden and is not so strong uh, in Italy. I can say this because I'm a, I'm a doctor specialized in preventive medicine. So <laughs> I think that uh, I can say this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I think my question was more asking like, yes, there is a, a, a degree of trust of the citizen in the government, but there is also a degree of trust of the government in the citizen. And we see in one case a government that trusts its citizens a lot. On the other hand, we see a government that does not trust its own citizens in the same way. Absolutely. I think this can be the, the base of a new presentation, Ricardo. We can think about it. Seems to me that we could have a seminar only on this uh, on this topic, uh, because this really addresses a very interesting uh, question about the, the relation between the citizen and the state and the, the different histories of, of these particular countries. But thank you so much for, for that question, Ricardo and uh, Elena, for your presentation. Um, I suggest we have a new uh, leg stretcher of five minutes. Uh, and then uh, in the meantime, I, uh, me and the panelists get prepared for, for, uh, for the panel starting at, uh, at four sharp. So be back at four, please. Thank you.
All right. So we have uh, the final hour and we're moving on to the panel discussion. Uh, and we're going to have two presentations. Um, but let me first introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, I already introduced uh, to you Elena Raffetti, who kindly agreed to, to join the panel because Ian Kuhnholm couldn't join us. So thank you, Elena, for that. Uh, and we also have Yuan Tonshia, who has all, already been uh, active in the forum uh, with his question. Uh, Yuan is professor in global disaster medicine. He is at the Center for Research on Healthcare in Disasters at Caroline State Institute. Uh, and Yuan is a medical doctor, just like Elena, but specialized in general surgery. And you're also a PhD in global public health, uh, I would think, somewhere, some, like, something like that. Uh, Yuan is also the co-founder, for those of you who don't know him, of the Swedish section of Medicine Sans Frontières, uh, the MSF. And um, his research explores how, explores how health needs and risks vary depending on type of disaster and context. And he has a lot of publications on this. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Johan has served as an advisor on disaster medicine to the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare, as well to the Stockholm County Council. And this past year, uh, he's been traveling to Lebanon and Beirut a lot, working as an emergency medical team coordinator uh, deployed by the WHO uh, following the Beirut blast and uh, also the explosion of COVID-19 cases in Lebanon. And finally, we have uh, Paola Alvrito, who is chief of branch of the intergovernmental processes, interagency cooperation and partnership of the UNDRR uh, the UN Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, Paula uh, was the head of what was then the UN ISDR, Regional Office for Europe, and has covered disaster risk reduction activities in the European Union since 2007. And she joined the UN ISDR headquarters in 2004 during the preparations for the World Conference on Disaster Reduction that many of you might have uh, attended. Um, and she also assisted the Intergovernmental Drafting Committee and Main Committee on the conference in, in charge of developing the Hyogo Declaration and the Hyogo Framework for, for Action that we know of. Um, before joining the UN ISDR, she worked uh, with the UN Resident Coordinator Office in Djibouti, I think it's pronounced, uh, as a coordinator um, and a program analyst supporting country offices in developing sustainable development policies and uh, also, in the beginning of, of Paula's career, she was at the United Nations Staff System uh, College in uh, Torino in Italy. And Paula holds a master's in international relations and political science from uh, the University of Torino. Um, and we've also done research at the International Institute of Strategic Studies in London. So you've been also in many places and long experience. I welcome you all. And I will start by giving the word to Yuan for a 10-ish minutes uh, presentation. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, and, and thanks for inviting me to this um, interesting uh, seminar. So I'm very happy uh, with this uh, multidisciplinary approach. And I think Juliana was highlighting it, that, that I think we need more of this uh, multi or interdisciplinary collaborations to address upcoming uh, threats to society. Um, and I think it became very clear during the COVID outbreak that we cannot be uh, acting in a vacuum. Uh, we need to interact and we need to prepare in advance. And um, it's interesting with my field, disaster medicine, which is very much on the response side, less on the um, uh, uh, on the pre prevention uh, to some extent on the preparedness and hopefully a bit on, on the resilient side and, and preparing societies and especially the health sector for upcoming health hazards. Um, and I think this sort of concept of, of being prepared and, and that was highlighted I think by Paul also during his presentation that you know that um, uh, we we everybody uh, uh, expects that there should be a response when the disaster happens, but to invest in this and to be prepared 
will require, I think, investments uh, in, um, for example, uh, intensive care unit beds that may be empty for some time, that you have a surge capacity to expand uh, when uh, the disaster happens. So uh, we are working quite a lot here uh, at the Center for Research on Healthcare in Disaster at the Karolinska Institute to expand uh, the interdisciplinary aspects to involve other uh, stakeholders as well. And uh, currently, I'm part of a task force uh, at the Karolinska Institute, uh, setting up what is called Health Emergency and Pandemic Science Center, which aims to uh, address um, upcoming uh, health emergencies in an in a inter- or multidisciplinary way and try to build uh, health system resilience to be prepared. And maybe not so much on the on the on the prevention uh, side of things, but but more uh, just like uh, we try to avoid road traffic uh, accidents and, and death from road traffic accidents, we need to have a system uh, in place to manage those uh, that are uh, uh, in the car accident. So you know, even with such a, um, a vision of of a zero fatalities in the traffic. Uh, uh, road traffic accidents, we need to have a system that's prepared for managing uh, those that will uh, eventually uh, become injured, despite this uh, uh, vision of, of zero uh, affected. Um, so I'm more on that sort of response side, but gradually that you are sort of operating case by cases, you want to, of course, avoid um, too many cases to end up in your operation theater. And by then, you, we, we were also working on, on more of the prevention and the resilience side of, of um, health emergencies. Um, we had a very interesting uh, seminar last uh, week with uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, the General Secretary of um, the, the World Health Organization with Melinda Gates Hart, as her name is nowadays and also with the health economist. And I'm, I'm not sure that you have heard of her, but uh, Marina Matsukati, And she's coined uh, the term of, of um, missions, uh, a mission moonshot uh, that we need to organize uh, ourselves and, and uh, more in line with big um, uh, upcoming uh, uh, challenges. And then everybody should get on board. And, and she's using in her book, uh, which is called Moonshot, uh, a mission economy, which is focuses on, on the moon landing, uh, that how JFK uh, uh, Kennedy in uh, United States in the beginning of the 60s, uh, you know, um, said that, okay, by the end of this, um, uh, uh, within 10 years, we should have landed on the moon. And the whole society gained, uh, got together, uh, whether it was in uh, uh, the medical uh, parts of, of uh, you know, making sure how can you survive in space and what are the challenges, material designs, computers, fuels, you know, everybody was engaged and they were also creating public partnerships. So, so she sort of uses that as, as some sort of strategy. And now I, I actually saw that Vinova is using the same um, approach that we need more of a mission um, uh, when addressing future uh, uh, challenges. So maybe that's a good opportunity to join forces uh, within the um, interdisciplinary approach to try to address upcoming threats uh, to societies uh, using an all hazard approach, um, because that's something that I've been noticing now following the pandemic, how uh, everything is reduced to viruses and to threats and almost uh, with a military uh, approach, um, uh, trying to uh, define strategies and responses to this sort of uh, uh, enemy that you cannot see because it's so small. And if you listen to Macron, he 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 looks into the cameras and talks about that the country is on war. And I think we we have to try to avoid uh, that approach and and being more sort of open, uh, not only in terms of, of the times of, of hazards and threats that, that we as a society are exposed to, but also uh, in defining the strategies on how to deal with it. And I think we heard here over the day that the importance of having a grassroots perspective or, or bottom-up approach, understanding the population, getting the trust of the population. And I think the, there's so much to learn from the, the recent um, COVID or the ongoing COVID pandemic in terms of, of um, societal uh, impacts and, and also revealing how um, the society, you know, risks of ripping apart between those that has and has not, between those that trust and, and do not trust. 
So I think there we have a lot uh, to learn from that and also try to address not only uh, like viral agents or specific hazards, but moreover, the whole societal's uh, uh, capacity to, to uh, respond. Uh, and from my perspective, uh, tomorrow we, we're starting um, uh, a course for, for medical doctors undergoing specialization in disaster medicine. And, uh, obviously, uh, on one hand, it has to be quite simple. So how do you manage mass casualty situations with uh, many injured uh, or, let's say, many sick from, from uh, COVID? How do you sort of um, use your resources in the most optimal way? And, and of course, this is a sort of uh, counter uh, intuitive for a lot of, of uh, the medical doctors because they are trained very much in their pajamas being based inside a facility to address uh, one patient at a time using maximum resources and having one individual uh, in their focus. But suddenly when they have 100 or 200, uh, it's sort of that, that the system that we put in place um, sort of collapses and, and we they simply cannot uh, work. So it's one way that you have to reprogram uh, them, uh, at least for this particular situation, to be, become a bit utilitarian. Uh, which is, of course, very challenging uh, because that's not how we are used to, to seeing ourselves. Uh, but in certain situations, that might be uh, what you need to do to focus on, on uh, the main uh, needs and, and, and redistribute the resources in the most optimal way. So it's a bit of, of reprogramming um, uh, the medical uh, doctors uh, to work in that context. And there's a lot, obviously, a lot to learn not only uh, from, from the health system perspective, but I think also from, from society. And, and I think um, that is, uh, at least in the Swedish society that we will uh, over the years um, uh, learn from, from the, 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 the COVID pandemic. And then of course, there's a lot of other things being uh, uh, unraveled in this, in this particular uh, COVID situation, such as inequities. Uh, and we see this with vaccine distribution, for example, but uh, coming back a bit to this uh, mission uh, or moonshot economy, I think we also have to be very careful to design uh, one disease solution when we know, for example, if you compare uh, the Swedish health system with the one in Congo DRC, uh, the differences in terms of, of money available for the health system varies around 500 times. So in, in Congo, you have around uh, yeah, 15 to 20 dollars per person per year to spend on healthcare, while in Sweden we have around six to seven thousand dollars per person per year. So the significant uh, the difference you need to adapt to that. So it's not only to park uh, vaccines in containers in Kinshasa and expect the health system to be able to deliver it while uh, children are still dying from measles. So that is a, a pedagogical challenge in, in the midst of, of dealing with inequities and redistribution of, of vaccines that uh, we have to be very careful and not to disrupt the whole health system in our efforts to provide uh, one with vaccine. And we saw this also with HIV uh, when it came and, and how it almost became, you know, with uh, these uh, ARV medications for for uh, HIV, how how that um, people with uh, that other diseases were not prioritized and, and children kept dying from from uh, easily treatable diseases. So um, I'm very happy to to uh, be part of of this panel and and uh, hopefully uh, we'll open up to more discussions on on how we together can you know set the research agenda and maybe come with some um, moonshot uh, thoughts, um, uh, some missions uh, for the future where we engage together and each of our disciplines, we work over uh, cross-disciplinary uh, and try to address it. I think it is a, it's a big challenge uh, uh, being a researcher because we are used to, like Ileana was showing in the beginning, we're eye-shaped, we, we are very much uh, working in, in, in silos, but I think uh, that is not the way uh, for the future. So uh, we are we we're going to have to try to work much better together and understand other disciplines, change terminologies, adapt uh, our methods, etc., to try to address to to address the real challenges. And I think I don't know, uh, Susan. Last time we were in the meeting, uh, somebody coined that you were responsible for the expression that that reality is interdisciplinary. And I've been, been quoting you on that, but I think it's, it's a fantastic, uh, you know, it's as simple as, as it is that 
we, we cannot reduce um, a, a reality to, to something that fits my methods and my building or uh, it has to be addressed in in the way it is out there. And, and that's why personally, I, I, I need to reg regularly work in disasters to understand what other uh, health or health issues or, or problems out there. And as, as Paul, Paul was saying, yeah, you have to find the research questions out there among the population and among the practitioners. And then um, more of an operational research perspective, try to you know, come with solution that fits um, uh, uh, those that are responding to disasters. Um, thank you. Thank you, you are an excellent food for thought, uh, uh, indeed. And also, again, on the production of knowledge and how we engage different social actors in, in this, uh, you know, uh, in these times, I would say. So, great. I will give the word to Paula for her presentation, please. Thank you very much, Suzanne, and good afternoon to all of you. Um, I don't have a presentation, but I will share a few considerations with all of you. Um, we are emerging from, uh, from the pandemic. And as we have already discussed today, one thing is clear. The disaster risk, including pandemic risk, but also climate risk, uh, but also risk caused by other natural and man-made hazards, is increasingly interconnected and systemic. And to effectively address this new risk landscape, we must put a multi-hazard risk reduction at the heart of all development investments, but also decision-making. Examples on the ground of what it means interconnected and systemic are many. I like to use the one from Somalia that during 2020 was hit hard by a triple threat disaster that included the biological hazards of COVID-19 in a fragile health system, a more um, traditional natural hazards, which is the locust plague, which actually affected the flood production and flooding that oversaturated and damaged critical infrastructure such as healthcare facilities. Uh, this is a concrete reminder that risks are systemics, but we continue, as uh, Johan was just saying, to work in silos where we need to act collectively. And this of course also addresses the research and the research need. Considering the risk is systemic, it requires concerted and urgent effort to reduce it in an integrated and innovative way. What we do have on the positive side, and it is an encouraging element, is that at the international level, the policy groundwork has been laid uh, with a multi-hazard risk reduction as the key elements that are part of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, but also that has been picked up in the context of the 2030 agenda uh, that really looks at risk-informed development as an overall achievement. This commitment has been reinforced and strengthened throughout the past two years, um, including with a recognition that disaster reduction and risk-informed investments in the intergovernmental outcome um, are importantly reflected. I can give you the example of the high-level political forum, but also the financing for development forum, the climate negotiation, but also the food system and biodiversity summit. And as COVID-19 uh, and the accelerating climate crisis show, it is therefore really time to put this policy commitment into concrete actions. And certainly the multi-hazard risk reduction is not an easy task. A first step is to urgently increase our knowledge and understanding of multi-hazards and systemic risk. A second step, is to better apply our scientific knowledge in policy and practice, including through enhanced risk communication and cross-sector collaboration, as Johan was also mentioning. And importantly, at a time when resources need to be spread over multiple priorities, it is essential that governments base their decision on data and solid research and actively look for lessons learned and share good practices, especially in developing countries. And this needs to be done in a timely fashion. I think time very often is our worst enemy, as, as we well know, when uh, we're discussing disaster and disaster prevention. So bridging the science and, and the policy device 
um, in order to become more concrete in terms of actions and resilience is one of the focus of my agency, UNDRR. And I can share with you a couple of examples on how we're trying to bring these considerations. First of all, in 2020, UNDRR, together with the International Science Council and the Public Health of England, worked with over 1,000 scientists and technical experts across the globe, maybe with some of you that are part of this, uh, of this gathering, and uh, published a hazard definition and classification review, identifying over 300 hazards threatening our future well-being, but also prosperity. I talk in the same language in this regards is a fundamental first step. I've been to so many gatherings where half of the discussion were on different definitions of what it means disasters and what it means prevention and what it means disaster reduction. So the exercise really allowed to reframe which hazards should be included with the scope of the Sendai framework, um, highlighting aspects of evolution in the thinking of the risk. And drawing on the Sendai framework, the review applies also a new definition of hazards from phenomena to include human activities and processes, which is something that was uh, also discussed by Paul. It sets out a strong case for an all hazard approach to achieve risk reduction as a basis for the sustainable development. These are elements that can really be picked up uh, in activities that are ongoing at the national level, but also at the local level, when communities are shaping up their local disaster risk reduction strategies, or when you're looking at the lost databases on uh, national statistics, legal accounting, but also when it comes down to investment decision. Um, and this is an important dimension that research needs to focus on. I don't think we're working enough on the legal and economic aspects related to risk and the decision making. We're also about to publish, and this is the second example, um, the framework for global science in support of risk informed sustainable development and planetary health, which was jointly prepared with the integrated research on disaster risk program and the International Science Council. The framework proposes nine priorities for research that are expected to align the efforts of the academic and technical community towards helping to achieve the goals of the Sendai framework, particularly in reducing risk. And these priority um, are not work plans or commitments, but in fact, there are directions to orient the disaster risk community in connecting cutting edge risk science with decision making for risk reduction. And uh, we're really looking forward not only to publish <laughs> this work, um, but also to promote regularly stock taking in the process of these nine research priority areas that have been identified. The focus of the work stems from the reality that although much research and progress has been achieved in disaster risk reduction over the past decade, must, a lot of the knowledge has remained unused. And this is due to the lack of an effective collaboration between all types of knowledge holders, policy and practice. So there is a disconnection that remains within and between disciplines, as well as between knowledge producers and potential knowledge users. This is an extremely important issue. And this issue has actually been one of the barriers in order to alleviate the poverty and reducing vulnerability and exposure to all forms of risk. Um, yet more needs to be done. And the question is how to combine different priorities at the time when the coronavirus is absorbing so much financial and human resources from governments all over the world. Um, health services, Johan was talking about it, have been under pressure. And in some countries, a breaking point over the past year and a half. I read recently that in some countries, uh, the bad block of cancer treatment could take years to clear. And this is due to hospital bottlenecks caused by the coronavirus. Uh, this also means that many who should have been diagnosed have not been uh, because of the missed referrals. And in many cases, it will now be too late to cure their cancer. Uh, I cite this because it is a striking example of the human and financial costs caused by the difficulties in combining different priorities when it comes to emergency and work that is ongoing in a routine manner. So there is no magic bullet there. 
uh, but addressing different and increasing priorities requires appropriate preventive investments in human resources, skills, infrastructure, and equipment. Um, too often, and we know this, we wait for the disaster to strike before really assessing our level of preparedness as well as fundamentally important, how we can reduce and prevent the risk. Um, and this applies to pandemic, but any other type of risk. But next to the high human cost, economic numbers show that this approach will no longer be feasible. Um, the IMF is predicting a total loss output of $28 trillion due to, to the coronavirus. Uh, with full economic uh, recovery that is envisaged for 2025. And overall, we're talking about 150 million people that will be put back into poverty by the end of 2021. So the pandemic, it's been a big threat, but as we also heard from the other speaker, it's not the only one. Swiss Re has estimated 18% in reduced annual global economic output worldwide as a result of climate change in 2050. So if you're looking at this threat, it is really essential that uh, we think long-term. And the recovery packages that the governments are designing today are going to be reshaping the economy for the long-term, um, representing life and death decision for the future generation, including through impact on climate and broader disaster risk. And to be truly sustainable, risk reduction must become the underlying basis of all recovery action. And, the research work needs to be made available to nurture this uh, renewal approach. So yet again, uh, we do not have the knowledge or tools to link very often economic development with multi-hazard risk data um, that are respectively developed in different risk assessment models. And um, that as a result talks about parallel data sets that we might be using from the financial point of view to the risk reduction point of view. So there are some initial attempts, including by the IMF and others, that are looking to integrate climate risk into financial stability assessment that should be expanded to develop a comprehensive risk management approach. Uh, the engagement of experts from all the scientific field in this uh, discipline is going to be very important. But we can also focus more attention on identifying some low hanging fruits that can deliver large results with low cost. For example, in many countries, there are unnecessary barriers on resilient investment, such as legal constraint, corruption, and, and time consuming bureaucracy. Really, um, together, we can uh, improve our economic performance. We can improve the way in which our entrepreneurial work is going to be moving ahead. But we also need the social and economic uh, research and study that are going to be help us on how to be more tangible in, uh, in addressing this, uh, this challenge. But beyond increasing advance and planning and having adequate level of investments in place, um, we also need to ensure that our capacity to anticipate and prevent systemic risk and respond to disasters are part of the overall investment in our society. And we do have some very good examples. Greener energy, uh, building that uh, can have lower healthcare costs and so on. Unfortunately, what we do see is that very often these um, considerations in terms of preserving biodiversity comes a little bit like the last thought. And this reminds me very much to what Paul had presented earlier on with the different four waves, which actually is telling us how big the problem is going to be, but also the perception is that uh, preserving biodiversity comes somehow as the last wave of concern, when in fact it needs to be very much at the heart of, uh, of our considerations. Um, importantly, and this is my last point, uh, government should see investments in research not as an add-on, but as a fundamental component of any plan to build a more sustainable future. And research should be prioritized today to build the resilience of tomorrow. Now, while I'm saying this, I also know that a number of governments are taking this very seriously. So it is an encouraging uh, message that we hear for some of them. Is this done systematically? Are consultation taking place? 
in a, in a in an overall manner through the governments the answer is, is no so more work that needs to be done in this regard and finally susan if you allow me maybe i i've already spoken more than i should i just wanted to share with you a last consideration is that it's very important in these discussions and in this debate to have the opportunity of coming together as a community whether you are living in a city whether you are an ngo whether you are someone that deals with the financial issues, climate, disaster risk reduction, people research and so on. Um, there are two opportunities that are coming up where this very large community is coming together. One is the global platform for disaster risk reduction that is going to be taking place in May next year from the 23rd to the 28th of May. It's taking place in Bali in Indonesia but it's in hybrid form. So there will be possibility also to be connected remotely. And then the second one that is coming up very soon is going to take place from the 24th to the 26th of November, uh, which is the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction, which will take place in Portugal. And there again, you will have the opportunity of these uh, different actors um, that are part of our society coming together and discussing how they can be more resilient to disasters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paola. Very important points. I was thinking when you spoke about the this anthropocentric approach to risk reduction, maybe we need a multi-species disaster uh, risk reduction approach. But now uh, I will uh, give the word to Elena. I will invite everybody to post their questions in the chat or think of them and you can post them uh, uh, by raising your hand. But first of all, I want to give uh, the chance to Elena to, to reflect on what has been said by Paula and, and Juan. Elena, please. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you for inviting me uh, to the panel. I think that's a, I found two points from Paula and Juan uh, very interesting. That is this connection between uh, scientists uh, and policymakers. And I would like to make two, some words on what is the role of science? What is, what is our role as a scientist? And I think we need to try to understand what is uh, uh, what we are place ourselves in the society. I think there are at least four ways to, to approach our role as a scientist. We can be a pure scientist, so we don't have con we don't want to have connection with the society. We do our research, and we are completely disconnected uh, from from the society and from the need of the society. Another option is that uh, the option to be an arbiter. I'm doing my research. Uh, and I'm evaluating what a government, uh, was, was, what other organizations are doing, saying this is good and this is not good. This is, can be an approach as an arbiter, as a scientist. Another approach is, can be uh, the scientist uh, uh, as a, uh, the advocacy um, approach. So I'm trying to tell the government, uh, our policymaker, you need to do like this because this is right. I'm Italian and I see this in the Italian community uh, more than in Sweden. A lot of scientists in television, in podcasts saying uh, this should, what it should be done. And among these, I think that there is a fourth way that is probably what we need to work and go through is the scientists as those that taking the concern of the community, look the possible solution and increase the number of the options. It's not the scientist that should decide what is good or bad uh, or decide this is the way, but say, I'm increasing the number of the options uh, and the governments, uh, organiz international organizations can decide, let's go in this direction. I think this is what we need to think, what we want to be, what we would like, that is our position. And uh, there are other couple of considerations that I, I would like to, to say that. We have seen that there have been a lot of publications during COVID pandemic, uh, and science, science, of course, has, uh, ha like, has been like uh, uh, the, this creates some solution like uh, the vaccine. Uh, we have increased our knowledge in the last year in an incredible way. But uh, I think we should, we should keep in mind that uh, our aim as a scientist should be to reduce uncertainty, not to create uncertainty. Sometimes we are making publications that are not answering questions or say, no, this hypothesis probably is not true, let's go in another direction. But we are doing science that is increasing uncertainty. And it's sometimes more for our own benefit. We know that uh, to, get to get funding, we need to get publication, more publication we have. Uh, 
in more high impact journals, uh, more it's easier to, we know that the scientific uh, world uh, is not have only have a, a positive feedback on the quality of science. Uh, but uh, I, I has been, uh, I'm working in the U for the UK, I'm working from Sweden for the UK, and I can give an example of what I'm seeing right now. I'm working for a consortium, but there are all, I don't say all because I'm not sure, but there are uh, a lot of uh, universities in the UK involved. And it's a consortium that has been funded by the British Heart Foundation and the, the British government. And it's incredible what they are doing. They have created uh, uh, databases and register that ex in, exist in Sweden, but the UK were not existing before. And they, they, have answer, they have questions from the NHS, from the National Health C um, Service in the, in the UK, and they answer questions in a very fast way. So it's not only one scientist that have a project, but it's a, a team of analysts uh, that using all this data and, to, to, and try to give answer in a uh, fast way. I saw the answer that they gave when they asked if uh, AstraZeneca was uh, giving blood clots or not. Uh, it's arrived a question the Sunday evening, Easter, and in very few weeks, they put together an amount of knowledge to try to answer the concern of the public uh, agency in England. So uh, I think we can learn from this experience as a, as a way to work in research and to answer public concern. And it's so nice to be in this panel and thanks again for inviting me. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Johan, Paula, you want to reflect on that? Uh, yes, I do, Susanna. Please go ahead, Paula. <laughs> if I may, a, a very interesting element, an example that um, Elena just gave in terms of uh, sharing data directly from this scientific world to the community. And, and I think this is something that somehow we need to do more. I think this, this gap between the policy making and, and the scientific community is an existing one. But I think through social media, through, through the interaction that uh, is, is, um, is a de facto for our communities, we need to have uh, a research, a scientific, uh, findings and, and actors that really learn to communicate better. Uh, what are their studies, what are their results, what are their considerations. And while today listening to, to a number of people that are, are researching and, and are dedicated to the topic, it was so um, nice, clear and communicative to hear. In my past experience, especially when I was on the ground at the national level, I've been to meetings where the scientific community was talking um, to, for instance, the civil protection counterpart. And, and the, the wording, the, the, the communication um, aspect was just non-existent. So I think there has been a, a, um, a move ahead in this important gap, um, but I think that it needs to be slightly more, um, more systematic um, in terms of, uh, of the communicative aspects of research. It should be almost a, a default element that is put in our projects, in, in the thinking that, uh, that any uh, of you of us is, uh, is moving forward. Thank you. You won, do you want to say something on yes, that maybe topic? Just just a very quick comment and then I think it would be nice to have some questions from the audience. I, yeah. I think uh, as a researcher, I think we need to, you know, uh, have a mirror up and ask ourselves, you know, how, how well did we perform? And um, I think um, you're dealing with uncertainty for sure. And, and this is un, un trespass territory. There were still, uh, I think, a lot of certainty from, from some of my, at least with, from the medical side uh, that expressed very clear uh, opinions uh, rather than maybe um, evidence-based and, and I think it also has shown that that um, in this type of situation the evidence will be very weak we will not have evidence because we haven't been there so it's a bit counter um, to what we have been used to and, and I think as scientists we have to be very clear about that that we don't uh, know we don't we have to deal with uncertainty but I think that journalists and, and also the public um, in general were very, they wanted some, some certainty. They wanted, uh, you know, hear what, you know, how, how to do it. And I think some of the, the scientists were a bit maybe trapped or, 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 um, or became epidemiologists without being it. So 
I think we have a lesson for our, ourselves to learn, uh, to, to, to see what can be our role and how to communicate uncertainty. Um, that is, is a, and also to what is science about? Well, science is about trying to, you know, strive towards more and more uh, uh, understanding and clarity, but we, we are not the truth. And I think particularly in terms of, of policy implementation that, you know, a lot of my you know colleagues that are working in, in this building here in, in or at the campus of Karolinska Institute, they have hardly been outside the, the walls of the campus. And, and, you know, they don't actually know so much what's going out there, the, on out there. So I think we have the theory and practice we need to understand much more. And that's where we need this interdisciplinary understanding. So I think together as scientists, we can communicate much better. And I think we can also maybe come a bit closer to, to uh, how to deal with uncertainty and how to also convince the, the public and, and journalists about this. Uh, but when everybody's looking for certainty, I think we should be very careful of, of uh, uh, claiming that we have certainty that we don't have. Um, so that was just a, a bit of reflection. Thank you, Johan. Approximately right rather than precisely wrong, as uh, <laughs> Giuliano uh, said. Uh, and together, trying to make best, best practices uh, in dialogue, uh, indeed. So anybody else in the, in the meeting, in the forum, who would like to uh, take the advantage of this, this opportunity to, to post questions to the panel or give any comment, uh, any, any idea, any... Yes, Andra, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, I was writing in chat, but then I thought it might be faster if I if I say it, because I think there is one aspect that is normally left out when it comes to risk perception, but also communicating uncertainty, and that is disability. And I was wondering how, like, there are ways in which we communicate both the risk and the solutions we provide in disaster risk management, but they are not always adapted to the needs of the people with disabilities. And we, we, when we, when I say people with disabilities, I'm not only mentioning people with functional or physical disabilities, but we can talk about chronic illnesses and. I don't know, autism, all these kind of uh, aspects that might be considered a disability when it comes to taking yourself to a safe space. So I'm wondering what are your uh, takes on that and how do you think we should communicate uncertainty better to people with disabilities, but also address risks and their risk perception? Mm. I don't know whether, I mean, I just, uh, it, it's a very good question, uh, especially in relating to COVID-19, because we know that those at highest risk of dying are those that are underserved, uh, maybe not physically disabled, but, but maybe more uh, economically uh, dis disabled. And you can say that those uh, at, ex uh, at risk for, for dying from, from COVID are the rich of the poor and the poor of the rich. Um, uh, that we see in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, that we have a lot of the political leaders, male in, in their uh, uh, 60s, that are have a belly and, and have hypertension and diabetes. And it's the same here in Sweden that those most at risk are, are those uh, um, uh, migrants with, with maybe uh, that have chronic diseases and, and are not uh, maybe have trust in the system. So. You know, in terms of vaccinations, I think probably this group should have been vaccinated first, but those that were first vaccinated were those living in, in the well-off areas of, of Stockholm because they were, uh, or, or in Sweden in general, because they were uh, the ones that, that could understand that vaccinations was the, so that's that's definitely an issue. And, and hopefully, yeah, we will learn something from it that, that who to focus on and, and very early on. I worked with the Ebola outbreak and it, it was the same there as well, you know, that you, you have to, start immediately and not, uh, you know, uh, and also the indirect effects of this pandemic in terms of, you know, violence against women and, and children being uh, not, uh, not, that cannot go to school, etc. So uh, I think also that is, is another dimension, uh, but it te we tend to focus on, on, on the, the, you know, almost war warlike rhetoric and, and I, 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 that's of course will promote uh, certain groups uh, that, uh, that can relate to this, but others will be underserved. And on my side, if I may, Andra, um, in the broader disaster risk reduction community, one element that for us is very important is the inclusion aspect, and also the, the overall principles of leaving no one behind. And um, for us, what is important is not to 
um, to work and to address issues for the people with disability, but it's actually to work with people with disability. Um, so for instance, uh, um, we have created uh, in terms of UNDRR, uh, multi-stakeholder engagement, uh, which is a platform where different actors are coming together in order to see how to implement this and die framework. And uh, um, we are actively working with the disability group. And I think this has been extremely helpful. Uh, whether it's uh, work on the ground, uh, leading to the inclusion of people with disability when the national strategy for disaster risk reduction or the local strategy for disaster risk reduction is being shaped up, um, but also to the broader and larger discussions that might be taking in the different fora, such as the global platform for disaster risk reduction. And by the way, just also to highlight that very often we organize uh, meetings and events and, and we don't think about accessibility at all and, and how people with disability can attend. And this is something that um, we have been really working towards as, as, uh, as UNDRR in the context of our global and, uh, and regional platform. And, and it is uh, truly a, an enriching experience because, as I said, you don't work for, you work with. And this is the most important concept in my view. I can also add uh, a very small comment on this. Uh, in, I think it's in epidemiological research, it's not so common in Sweden, but it will be very important to include more uh, lay members when we are designing a study and to discuss our results. Because what we try to do is that we like to see clear results, uh, low uncertainty. So we exclude uh, uh, more complicated patients or people with disabilities, when probably it's uh, important to see the interaction of this factor with exposure that we are studying. So, I think we need to go towards uh, sci uh, science, as Pazola say, not uh, uh, defining for, but to work in with, to answer their concern. And we I think that we need to work more in Sweden towards this direction. It's quite common in UK and other European countries, not so common in Sweden. Thank you, Elena. Um, any further questions, comments? So I think maybe it's time to start wrapping up. I want to thank you all, you one, Paula and Elena, for joining this panel, uh, given your thoughts on many different aspects on the production of knowledge, the role of experts and the use of expertise and how do we engage uh, uh, also tapping into to, uh, Paul's, uh, or Paul's idea, I mean, <laughs> or Plato's idea of, of dialogue, right? Uh, uh, and and we have a lot of work ahead, but this meeting is indeed uh, uh, an opportunity to keep up keep up the spirit and keep uh, keep going on in and um, with dealing with all these challenges that we we continue to have have ahead. So I thank you uh, very much to the panel, and I will now give the word to uh, back to Giuliano who will close uh, the, the, the day and the forum, this, this session, afternoon session, but also the forum. So please, Giuliano, the word is, the is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. I'll, um, um, I would like to, uh, to say a few words on the, on the discussion um, uh, and also um, as, a, as a take home message after this uh, nice uh, day. Uh, reach of presentations, ideas, and, uh, um, and a nice exchange of, of perspectives. Uh, definitely, uh, what we, we can see, and um, as it was mentioned many times, probably the COVID-19 pandemic emphasized this aspect. Uh, there is a broader recognition of the complexity of the problem at hand. Uh, we know there are not uh, very, um, there are no universal solutions out there and that um, uh, we need to recognize and embrace the uncertainty which is, which is associated with natural hazards and disasters. Uh, and, uh, and we are learning, this was very clear from uh, numerous presentations, and there is also a closer dialogue between uh, the different actors involved, uh, academics, practitioners, and uh, uh, other stakeholders, and what, I, what was also um, presented, uh, also discussed in the last panel, is also the, that we have become better in communicating uncertainty and support the decision-making process. 
And uh, uh, we are happy uh, as CNDS to offer a platform uh, to have a discussion on this field and also to support a continuous dialogue, which is what we really believe is needed uh, to uh, tackle uh, these issues. So um, I would like um, to make sure that this, to, to, to have the CNDS forum only as a milestone of our dialogue uh, that should continue. And uh, specifically, I would invite everyone to uh, look at our website and, uh, and see our uh, future initiatives uh, seminars as, and workshops in which we also discuss more specific aspects related to natural hazards. In saying that, I also take this chance to remind, um, well, not to remind, to indicate everyone that as right now on the chat, Stephanie has written, we will uh, uh, send you an evaluation form uh, that you can already see there. It consists of a number of multiple choice questions, so it's not doesn't take too much time to do. Uh, Andra will also send an email tomorrow with a link to it. Uh, this is very important to us because we would like to get better. We would like to improve the way in which we uh, uh, we work and uh, uh, also we organize different meetings. Of course. Uh, we really hope the next event will be uh, in a different uh, fashion in the sense of having uh, a, a physical event with in-person interactions, but it could also be uh, that hybrid uh, versions will uh, stay with us in the future also to uh, reduce uh, unnecessary uh, travel. Uh, so please, if you have the chance to provide your feedback, that will be very valuable to us. And then I conclude uh, with uh, some words of thanks. And um, I would like to thank uh, Susan for moderating uh, the, uh, the event this afternoon and Jorge in the morning. And also uh, the panelists, panelists and the speakers we had today, uh, Paul, uh, Paola, Johan and Elena. Um, your views, I mean, and your perspectives were, are very uh, valuable to uh, CNDS. And uh, I think we had a very a nice exchange of ideas. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, uh, Stephanie, Andra and Joanna for uh, organizing all uh, the logistics related to the uh, CNDS forum. I think everything went very smoothly. And, um, uh, and with this, uh, I think I can also thank all the uh, people who participated. We had uh, a total of uh, above 100 participants between the morning and the afternoon. Uh, this is great uh, that after so, long, so many Zoom meetings, uh, and many of us are, of course, tired of this type of online events, but there is still a strong participation. So thanks. Thanks again, everyone. And uh, have a good continuation for the evening. And I guess if there are no urgent matters, I will close the meeting.